So welcome everybody. We are very happy to have Tim Lauks here as our speaker today. And we are looking forward to his talk on local minimizers of the area functional based on a concept of local paired calibrators. Tim, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and thanks, Armin um, and Simon for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this with you. This is the first time that I talk about this, so some of the slides are maybe still a little bit rough around the edges, but I hope uh, I'll be able to communicate the idea. Um, so this is, uh, um, so I'm gonna talk about local minimizers and uh, to this end, uh, I'll tell you what local paired calibrations are. So this is based on uh, joint work um, with uh, Julian Fischer from IST. Sebastian Hensel, a postdoc here at Bonn, and Teresa Simon, who's now uh, at uh, Münster. So, um, okay. So let me start by explaining, uh, recalling what, what uh, calibration is uh, in general, and then I'll get uh, more specific and then I'll kind of pin it down to the problem that I actually uh, want to consider. So the usual framework that we see calibrations is the following, that we have uh, some oriented k-dimensional submanifold, and uh, then we want to find a calibration for reasons that I'll, you'll see later on this slide. Um, and the calibration is the following. It's a k-form that is defined not only on, uh, on uh, the, the manifold, but, uh, but kind of um, in the surrounding space. So, um, so uh, this is, uh, th this is uh, um, a calibration if the following three conditions fall true. So uh, it's closed, so um, uh, exterior derivative is, is zero. And it satisfies this upper bound here for any uh, k-plane that I can put in here. Uh, so um, so this, this, uh, this upper bound um, kind of, uh, uh, that kind of, when it acts on, on k-planes, it gives you uh, always uh, nothing, n never more than, than kind of the volume form. And this uh, inequality is saturated at every point on the surface when you plug in the tension space of that particular surface. So this is how kind of the, um, the surface and uh, the form talk to each other. And this is why, um, why it kind of strongly depends on, on the surface, right? So, um, and when you, uh, when you have such a calibration, uh, this is wonderful because there's this fundamental property of calibrations that says the following. Um, well, if you have a calibrated submanifold and you take any other submanifold with the same uh, boundary, so here I have a picture illustrating this, then you can easily get this, uh, this inequality here. So um, using item number three, um, you can first uh, compute what the volume is um, then using the closeness and Stokes theorem, you can, uh, you can express this uh, um, as the integral over this competitor. And by two, you have this inequality that says uh, um, that, that, that this integral is bounded above by the volume of, of, the, of the competitor. So that means that uh, whenever you calibrate it, uh, you minimize the area. Um, and uh, like most magical things, uh, this comes from complex, uh, uh, complex um, uh, numbers from complex geometry here, um, and um, then made its way to to kind of more singular um, uh, geometry. <clears throat> and uh, so I think Harvey and Lawson were the two who coined the term calibration for this uh, for this concept. So I want to get now first more specific. Um, and and just focus on the case of co-dimension one, so D minus one dimensional submanifolds. Then things get a little bit easier, and then I want to make it a little bit more difficult. So let's first uh, focus on making it a little bit easier. So if you have a hypersurface, instead of working with a surface, um, it's oriented. So so um, maybe we we sh should think of uh, a set whose boundary that surface is. So then uh, maybe I want to consider this problem here. So you give me some uh, some boundary, uh, some part of the boundary of your domain D, the container in which I want to 
pose my minimization problem um, and say this one here should be uh, should be where uh, kind of the, the um, um, my, my um, whatever open set here touches the boundary. Um, and that kind of specifies the boundary conditions that were before the, the, those two points. And now I'm kind of saying, uh, um, I'm specifying it through this uh, um, kind of, uh, D minus one dimensional set uh, gamma, which is a little bit more convenient, for example, to prove existence is, uh, is now, you can just do this in kind of the framework of sets of finite perimeter, which is uh, maybe a little bit easier. And, uh, and this, this would be the minimization problem. So now, uh, what would be a calibration? So I just translate everything from the previous slide um, to this case. So instead of uh, instead of uh, a d minus one form, I can I can now use a vector field, and uh, then this should be divergence free, and the length of the vector field should be bounded by one, and on the boundary of that of that particular set. So that was before that was our surface sigma. So sometimes I will also use this notation that the boundary is. Uh, of a uh, sigma, so this should be on the boundary of this inside D. Maybe. So on this red line, it should be exactly equal to the normal, um, and that and that would be a, that's a calibration in this case. And the fundamental property is still the same. If you have such a surface and uh, you can find such a extension now of the normal vector field. Um, you, you guaranteed to, to have uh, the, to, that this thing is a minimizer. So what, what I'm interested in uh, in this talk <clears throat> is the following problem. Um, it's kind of the second simpler problem, but a little bit uh, uh, more general because we want to find optimal partitions. So I don't give you just, uh, um, just uh, one, uh, well, I think let's say two regions gamma one and gamma two of the of the boundary of sub, sets of the boundary of, of my domain, but I give you let's say maybe three. So I have gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three um, clockwise. Okay, let's go. Um, and and now I want to find um, any uh, any partition. So that would give me a one. Oops. Um, that would partition my, my, my domain here into three parts um, so that their respective uh, intersection with the boundary is exactly the prescribed boundary here. Um, and I want to minimize the total length of these curves here. So that's just uh, because I'm counting here twice and divide by two um, and that would be the, the functional. So later I'll also talk about how to generalize this, uh, to how to put weights here. Um, and okay, but but for the mo most most for most of the talk, maybe we can just focus on this isotropic case. So, for this particular problem, um, there was a very uh, wonderful uh, paper by Lawler and Morgan, who came up with this idea of paired calibrations. So, so now let me draw this again. The these points here. <clears throat> and maybe I draw already what I think uh, should be optimal here. Um, something like this maybe. Um, and uh, so, so a paired calibration comes in the following form. So these, these are paired calibrations. So, so I have, um, if I have three phases, I will have three vector fields for each phase one vector field. And they should all be um, divergence free, just like before. And kind of for each interface, I have kind of two indices, kind of what's on the left and what's on the right. So naturally you should look at kind of always pairs of these vectors. And so we take the difference of these, of these vector fields and they should kind of emulate what the normal would be. So they should be less or equal to one. And on each of these, uh, of these interfaces, they should be the respective normal. So you can choose one of them, they, they, they agree up to a sign. Um, so uh, you choose one of them, uh, and so they look. They they should look like this. Um, this is one of them. This is another one. Um, this is what they are on these surfaces. But then you have to extend them them in some sense. So maybe in this case here, you want to extend them um, just uh, 
um, kind of uh, constantly everywhere. And, uh, and you could try, maybe that works out. <clears throat> In this case, actually it does. Um, <clears throat> so that is, uh, that is the concept of paired calibration. So um, the fundamental property of these, uh, of these paired calibrations is the same as before, that kind of if you have a calibrated partition in, the, in this case now, then uh, this minimizes the total surface energy, um, always subject to its own boundary conditions. So the, the proof is so nice that I have to show it to you. Um, so we'll go through this uh, together. Um, the box is already here. It's not so difficult, but I would like to go through this uh, as the only actual proof I want to show you. Um, okay, so um, remember this vector field here, Xi minus Xij, this has length at most one. So um, the scalar product with some uh, unit vector is of course uh, less or equal to one. So I have this lower bound for the energy of any competitor. So what I want to do now is, uh, I mean, the first time I keep it like this, Xi times mu i tilde, this is just uh, what it is. But I, get, I claim that I get the same term for this second product because of course on that interface, uh, I know that, um, as I said before, they are kind of related by just um, one normal points in exactly the opposite direction uh, of the other one. So you get twice the same thing, you just rename the indices. So that's why the two disappears and you get, uh, you get this term. So now I would like to carry out the sum over J. So nothing here depends on J, only the domain. And what I'm doing here is I kind of, I have a kind of, uh, um, uh, I have a partition of, of the boundary of the set AI tilde into the respective components where it meets kind of the other phases. Um, so when I sum over all J, I just get the whole perimeter of that set. So I just get this term here. So now we're in business because um, this, is, uh, this is now what we did before with Stokes. Uh, now we can use Gauss uh, theorem. And uh, so I just uh, carry out uh, uh, this integration by parts. So Gauss theorem. And you see, uh, you get the divergence of that vector field. And you get, of course, another boundary term because, uh, um, because this is not the full boundary of that set. There's also this part here. Well, but this term here only depends on the boundary conditions. And this one here, by assumption, was 0, right? That's one, that was the di divergence of, the, of these vector fields. And um, then the, the last uh, observation that you have to make is that, well, there was just one inequality. Otherwise, I mean, we didn't do anything. And this inequality is an equality when you take uh, our red uh, calibrated, um, um, calibrated uh, configuration, because there we knew that this vector is exactly, um, exactly this, uh, this normal. Um, so that finishes the proof. And, and our goal here is to kind of Better understand this proof to find uh, how to how to how to uh, get from from this basically um, a localized version. Um, so before doing this, maybe I should I should mention that of course uh, it's a, it's a good question. Then can you find uh, calibrations for any uh, kind of reasonable um, configuration? And here's maybe one that uh, was not known before to be a minimizer uh, back then. Um, so, so this, so, so take a tetrahedral, uh, um, so a, a wire shaped in this, uh, um, uh, this tetrahedron, and you dip it in soap, uh, soap water, and then uh, um, most of the time you will see this thing here. Um, sometimes it won't work, but uh, uh, you, you will see this, and this is just the cone over the over this tetrahedron, and. Uh, um, and this you can calibrate, for example, but also you can calibrate maybe just a triple junction in, in 2D and so on. Um, so th it's, it's an extremely useful tool, but well, if you allow me the pun, uh, maybe not, uh, not everything is a global minimizer, but maybe we're interested in local minimizers. So I want to go from this uh, global property to just something maybe we can find something that, that localizes this and they just know that I do perturbations and I'm not gonna, um, not gonna decrease the area. Okay. So and here's, here's what we propose is the following. Um, 
So, so it's I'm, I'm trying to kind of keep the same uh, keeps the same uh, structure as in the other definition of Lawler and Morgan. Um, I just uh, change uh, some small things. So, so the first condition, this uh, divergence-free condition. So we just need this first of all, just for the difference of two vector fields, because this is somehow what what plays a role, right? This this xi minus minus xij that is the kind of the key player here. And, and now this one here is weaker because we, we require less. We just require this to be zero close to, close to the interface of these two um, um, of these two of these two uh, of these two sets. Um, second, we make a little bit stronger um, the shortness condition because I mean, so this is the old shortness condition, and we make it stronger because we want it to be actually really a bit shorter. When you're away from from uh, from that interface, so really uh, quite a bit. Uh, so there should be a, a fixed amount that you're shorter than them. And also the third condition. We also want to strengthen this a little bit, so there should be an extension of that unit normal vector field. But also, whenever they're close to a unit vector, they should be close to that particular unit vector. Okay, um, so that is that is the definition, and uh, um, we'll see that it's uh, that it's useful in a moment. So this is I mean, so now I'm coming to the to the main result of the talk, namely that uh, regular flat partitions are local minimizers. Okay, so what is a regular flat partition? Um, so you give me a domain, and uh, I want to partition it into into let's say p this a number of phases um, p uh, p sets. And, uh, and uh, I want to do this only using straight line segments and they can come together in triple points, but not uh, higher order junctions. And, and when they come together, um, they should come together in equal angles, at equal angles. So like the example I drew before, so they should look like this. Um, they should be exactly 120 degrees, all three angles here. And this is, this is what we, what, what, what's a regular flat partition. So flat, because they are flat, and regular usually um, is, uh, is what we use for um, to describe that we have only triple points and uh, and this equilibrium condition. So this is this is really uh, this 120 degrees. Uh, that, I mean, it's kind of uh, why should one of the angles be different, right? Uh, because everything is uh, isotropic, and we have the same surface tensions in each interface. Um, and on the other hand, you can you can also see this. This is a kind of a balance of forces condition. So it's very natural. And, and here's the theorem. Uh, so there's still a work in progress, but should be out soon. Um, so you give me a, a bounded convex set, and then any regular flat partition um, of that set is a local minimizer with respect to its own boundary conditions. Okay, so in some sense, the result is optimal because when you have networks that kind of violate these conditions, so for example, you have triple points with uh, kind of the wrong angles, or you have higher order junctions, or you have triple or higher order junctions on the boundary, they are not optimal. So for example, uh, let's see, um, if you have, uh, if you have a, a higher order junction, let's say for example, um, this one here, it's, it's cheaper to break this up into two triple junctions um, and you can make them as close as, as you want to this. There's kind of, this is a direction where kind of the energy would go, go down. So this is not gonna be a local minimizer. Um, maybe one thing that I didn't mention here, I'm gonna mention it in the pr more precise results later is that uh, this local minimizer, of course I have to kind of put a topology on my, on my sets. Um, so uh, this is just L1. I will see this in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so that's the that's the result. Um, and maybe let me give you first some some other um, references um, similar to to what we do, and uh, and then I'm gonna go a little bit more into details about what's behind this result. Um, okay, so so uh, another way of uh, um, kind of uh, changing the setup is. Uh, 
um, to to uh, to work in in covering spaces so that you can get uh, more interesting uh, more interesting topologies. Um, so this is, for example, if uh, if you want to maybe find a minimizer that connects the two uh, the two uh, uh, the two sides two sides of the te tetrahedron and each two sides uh, there's there's still a discussion ongoing discussion what the minimizer is then in that case I think, um, but there's a clear uh, I mean. Yeah, people have ideas, but it's uh, it's not there's no proof yet. I think, um, and for example, um, uh, Marquez and Masachesi they they looked at um, calibrations for currents with coefficients in a finite group. I mean, so they didn't come up with looking at currents in a, with coefficients in a finite group, but came up with the calibrations in that in that setting. The point is, um, why do you need to when you do this for currents? Why do you need a, a finite group in this case? Because um, when you look at currents, uh, um, if I give you these boundary conditions and I just take currents with, uh, let's say, integer um, coefficients, um, this triple point here will always be a part of the boundary. Um, so you have to kind of uh, mod this out that uh, kind of these, these points where you kind of put a little bit modeling in there to say what, what you want uh, to be to happen here. Um, okay. Um, and then, so what, what we did recently is uh, to look at dynamics and kind of, uh, um, um, so we were interested in mean curvature flow and uh, found these gradient flow calibrations that, that kind of also are inspired by Lawler and Morgan, um, where we kind of also weaken this concept in some sense that we say, okay, the divergence constraint doesn't have to be exactly um, satisfied and so on. Um, but uh, but it's still not the same as, as we, we do here because I mean uh, uh, but uh, the, the, these things are very closely related I would say but it's not that one follows from the other so these are really different different regimes and and here we use this to prove weak strong uniqueness then we can extend this in, in several ways so um, so I think we found good assumptions that we should put on uh, on the weak solution and. Uh, um, one can also include boundary conditions, um, and well, what's difficult for in these in these in, in, I mean, so usually these, these calibrations, once you have one, it's beautiful, but uh, to construct them can be hairy, and and that is the case, for example, for these gradient flow calibrations when you want to do this in higher dimensions. So that's somehow maybe expected that this works, but it's uh, still um, something one has to carry out. Um, and we did this at least for um, what we call double bubbles, so triple line clusters where you don't have uh, quadruple junctions, which still is an open problem also here. And then uh, you can also look at other geometric flows um, that, for example, preserve the, the enclosed volume. So the simplest one is volume preserving mean curvature flow, but then maybe the more interesting ones are Malin Sikirka, which is uh, which is a third order um, um, evolution equation where you kind of a third order because you have a Dirichlet to Neumann operator there, um, and uh, something I find also very exciting, and that's something I'm doing with uh, my PhD student Milan Krömer, um, is surface diffusion flow. So to to use this calibration method to to understand surface diffusion flow. So that's a fourth order equation, and it's also motivated. Um, by, by kind of diffusing particles on a surface that, that kind of shrinks or grows according to where the particles go. Um, okay, so this is maybe some background. And now let me tell you a little bit more about the result. So why, why only now? So in the 90s, uh, Lola and Morgan had this uh, very beautiful paper and, uh, uh, and, and I, I didn't even show you the whole paper. I mean, I didn't show you the, their full result. This, I mean, they, they do this for um, very general anisotropies uh, for each of the each of the uh, interfaces. So this is a very general result, and um, it's very neat. Um, but why did it take so long that uh, that uh, we we can now um, do this kind of uh, local version of this? And the problem is that uh, I think probably the, I mean the, one of the technical uh, challenges is that local minimizers are not isolated. So here's a one parameter family of local minimizers, and that's exactly our enemy in some sense. 
so first of all, I mean, each of them are, is a local, local minimizer, and then it's clear that they should all have uh, uh, the same the same energy. But I'll show you a computation in a moment that you see that they have the same energy. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I, I can show you this. <clears throat> so so here I just plotted all of them in one uh, picture, and you see they only uh, uh, they only differ kind of here in the center. So let me just uh, show that show you that the black and the red configuration have the same energy. So I just show you the center here, um, this, this nice hexagon with a red hexagon in there. And I have to compare the total length of the red lines. You have to compare this to the total length of the black lines. Um, so let's just look at one of these triangles. And the upper left corner doesn't count to, to the triangle. And then kind of what I have is just six times this, right? Um, that is exactly what this picture is. And I just have to compute the length. And now maybe I'd leave it up to you to, to see this, that because this is an equilateral triangle, this length is the same as this one here. Okay, I mean, I think, uh, but I think it's good to, to have said it at least once. Um, okay, so this is how you can see that they all have the same energy. Can, can I ask a, just a quick question? So you're about to answer it probably, but uh, the, the uh, Tim, it's Rob. Uh, so th this is um, an interesting example of loss of compactness also in your, in your mm -hmm. category. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, that is that is true. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, so, so we can come back to it. I didn't. I didn't mean to. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, so, so if you had a sequence, uh, I mean, why is it not compact? Okay. We. Yeah. Saying, we should come back to this. <laughs> The six the six fold vertex that you get in the the limit of your family um, also has the same length by your argument. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not in your class of objects. That's all. I, I just it, let's come back to it. I didn't mean to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, no. I'm sorry for derailing the. Very no. No. This is perfectly fine. I'm happy to to discuss. I'm just. I just. Somehow I didn't didn't really get it, but let's let's get back to this in the question session. I, I would try to. That's like what I was aiming for. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, loss of compactness. I mean, yeah, we should talk about this. Um, so so here's uh, I mean the, the global minimizer doesn't look like this, right? I mean they're not global minimizers because I mean they they all have the same energy. So I could, for example, shrink this uh, uh, this hexagon down to the center. And then, of course, it would be better to put some triple junctions there, or I could increase it all the way um, to the to the boundary. And maybe that's what you're talking about. Uh, um, that, uh, but we will get back to this. That this would be the limit when I do this. But of course, there's someone doing better by just erasing that one uh, um, that one interface here. Right. I couldn't have done this before, but now I can do this, and this is uh, um, this is uh, of course doing better. Okay, so, but anyway, so this is when I want to show that, for example, this black curve here is a local minimizer. Well, I cannot, I mean, I, I cannot lose anything in my estimates because there's, at, in any neighborhood, I can find such a blue configuration that is very close to it, right? So I have to, I have to uh, be careful with this. So this also came up in, in other um, problems. So I just show you this because I love uh, mean curvature flow and curve shortening flow. So Kinderlehrer and Liu, they, they, um, they have a nice paper from 2001 where they look at um, kind of two or slight perturbations of, uh, of, of one of these configurations. And then they look at the long-term asymptotics. And it's quite interesting that you don't convert, I mean, you converge, I mean, the, they prove existence for all times and so on. There's some PDE problems that you have to take care of but you can prove long time in, uh, existence. And then you can prove that you will converge to a critical point. And it's gonna be one of these uh, one of these things in our list there, in our one parameter list. Um, but it's not gonna be, not necessarily gonna be the same one, especially when I do this here. So I indent, um, I dent this in a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna converge to a different one. And there's a beautiful uh, um, reason behind this that I want to share with you, of course. Um, which is the von Neumann rule, uh, which is a very beautiful observation for this multi-phase mean curvature flow, I mean, curve shortening flow of these uh, networks. 
Um, that's something that only happens for two dimensions. Um, that the, so let me just uh, mark this uh, grain. Uh, so so this area here will not change. Okay, and it did this by hand. This should be the same area. Um, and this is not going to change because of this famous von Neumann. So von Neumann n minus six rule. So it says that the area enclosed by such a grain, uh, I mean, for the, these outside here doesn't work because they, they, there's some boundary effects here. So you have to be careful there, but for everything that is not uh, touching the boundary, that's okay. Um, so the rate of change of the area that I enclose here is equal to some constant times n minus six. And n is the number of triple junctions that are here on the boundary. Okay, so this one here has six of them. So that is exactly the case when this is zero. So this doesn't change. So this area is equal to this area. And uh, well, when I dent, when I kind of dent this in, uh, I lose some area. And so of course I will have to converge to someone else. Okay, so this is a um, very nice uh, observation by Kindler and Liu. Um, and is of course somehow connected to this, somehow related to, to our problem. Okay. So here's uh, maybe the, um, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> okay, that's the order that I do. Okay. Um, so here's the, it's not really the workhorse, but it's maybe the fundamental observation. And that is kind of the analog of the computation that I showed you. Um, and so, so the, this uh, observation by, by uh, Lawler and Morgan, which is the following. So give me two uh, configurations. So two partitions, A tilde and, and A, and I will maybe talk about their, their associated, char associated characteristic functions just for the sake of the formula later. Um, and I will also include this, these notions here, these symbols for the interfaces between phases i and j in the respective configurations. So let's suppose there exists uh, the, these vector fields that will later play the role of our uh, um, calibration, but let's just assume they, they satisfy this, that they, on the red interfaces, they are exactly, they give you exactly the normal. Then we define this relative energy and then this computation of Lawler and Morgan becomes an equality. So I'm just not estimating, but I'm just exactly computing what's, what, what happened. And I just take care of all the terms. And this is the extra term that we get. And, uh, and here I collected the terms in a way that makes this uh, divergence CI minus divergence CJ appear. So this is very convenient for us. So this is um, really a similar computation to the one before. So I'm not gonna show you the proof of this, but I would like us to, to look at this for a moment. So what we're saying here is, so in particular, if, if, this, uh, if these vector fields really were a, a local paired calibration, then um, in addition, we would know that CI minus CJ would be less or equal to one, which means that this functional here would be greater or equal to zero. And uh, if these two partitions had the same boundary conditions, um, then this boundary term here, on the boundary of the domain would vanish. So we're almost there. So we have the energy of our competitor is equal to the energy of our calibrated uh, configuration plus some non-negative term. Well, we're not quite there yet because it's plus yet another term, okay? So the name of the game is absorb this in here. Right, so, that is, so that's the only thing that is left. You just have to estimate this term with the divergence in there by the relative energy. Okay, so that's that's um, that's all that's left to do after after this lemma. Okay, so and what we actually prove in the theorem is, of course, always these two things: every regular flat partition um, has a local calibration. So um, for this, we need a convex set, uh, and then you can construct these calibrations. Um, and if you have such a local calibration, then 
you are a minimizer of the area functional um, in some L1 neighborhood. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not going to show you the proof, but I want to show you kind of here our arc enemy. Uh, what's uh, what's kind of uh, what's kind of why is it okay even if I try it with the arc enemy? Okay, so that was this one parameter family, and so in each neighborhood I can always find one of these other configurations, and they have exactly the same energy. So when I um, when I want to estimate, I have to be very precise for these guys. Okay, so we, we said this, this one uh, was zero, right? They have the same boundary conditions, so that's fine. Um, and I'm looking at this red configuration. That is really the thing that I want to calibrate. And I need to understand what this, uh, what this term here is doing. The problem is this relative energy that is uh, one minus uh, this, uh, the scalar product of these vectors is exactly zero. So there's no help from here. This is exactly zero. So then I better hope that, well, this extra term here is also zero, right? Well, that is okay because our, our construction was uh, this divergence, or, or let's say, maybe I draw it down here. This here is equal to zero, maybe in some uh, area, let me maybe draw this in blue, some blue uh, region around this. Okay, so this here, some blue, some small thin neighborhood around this. And if you compare to this uh, blue competitor, that's fine because he lies exactly in there. And so that's exactly zero and we're fine. And now you might wonder, yeah, I, of course I can find one of these guys who's a little bit further away, but that uh, you take care of by making the neighborhood small enough. Okay, this is just what happens to, these, to, these, to this family of sets. So this is not, not a proof yet of these, uh, of these uh, of, of this uh, um, of the second proposition, um, but it somehow uh, gives us hope that uh, at least uh, this one parameter family doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't destroy uh, the theorem. Um, okay, and uh, um, so, so instead of now showing you more uh, details, so, so there's some gory. Uh, Gory computations. That's why it's also in, in 2D. I mean, one of the reasons why it's in 2D because we will need some structure also. Um, but instead of going into these details, I would like to tell you a little bit about the generality um, of the result um, and and tell you a little bit about uh, surface tensions. So, I mean, this is this is what I mean. This is closer to the to the reality that we of the problems that we actually want to solve. So where at least I have for each interface a different weight in here. This is called a surface tension. And if we're honest, these uh, should actually be functions that depend on the normal of that interface as well. So they should depend on i and j and on the normal of that interface. Um, but uh, okay, so that's that's. Uh, uh, but at least this, this we can do when kind of, it's isotropic along each interface, but different weights for different interfaces. And there's a very nice, uh, uh, very nice proper, I mean, kind of, kind of there's a property that was observed by Lawler and Morgan that is exactly the right property, which means that this matrix of surface tensions, you just put all these numbers in a matrix, this should be L2 and embeddable. That means, you can find points um, kind of that, uh, that form a simplex in, in some Euclidean space, such that the number that you get for i and j, so the surface tension between phase i and phase j is exactly the Euclidean distance, that's why L2, Euclidean distance between these points. Okay. So this uh, already appeared in uh, Law and Morgan uh, just as an abstract condition and it's, it makes lots of sense and, and it's exactly, um, uh, the thing that rules out nucleation. So nucleation is the following. Suppose you have a very beautiful uh, triple junction here. Now um, you think everything is fine, but then um, it could be that um, that uh, that uh, that uh, it's better to to nucleate a fourth phase in here. 
and, and that might uh, decrease the total area. And that can actually happen if you violate this condition here. Um, so that's called nucleation. Uh, uh, and then another thing that's uh, another um, uh, kind of phenomenon that you would like to rule out is wetting, which is the following. If I have one interface, it should not be better to have a very thin uh, second interface next to it, sorry. Um, so that I go from one, uh, let's say, from A1 to A2 to A3. This should not be cheaper than just going from A1 to A3. And that is just exactly um, uh, the, the triangle inequality between these numbers. Um, so in this case, it should be that sigma 1, 3 is strictly less than the sigma 1, 2 plus the sigma 2, 3. And that is uh, implied by the triangle inequality in, in uh, Rp minus 1 in just this, uh, in just this Euclidean space. Um, and the fact that these uh, that kind of the, that these are general points in the sense that uh, kind of the the simplex they form is non-degenerate. Okay, and here's uh, um, here's I mean I'm going to show you I know that in this community maybe not everybody knows what the reed shockley formula is so I'm going to show you this on the next slide. Um, so. That's something that uh, that we put in an updated version of some some uh, of this uh, on this mean curvature flow paper, because we found this uh, uh, quite. Um, I mean, I think one should mention this that, well, it's not only an abstract condition, but you can verify this condition for a class of uh, of surface tensions that actually appears in material science. Um, okay, so the inspiration for this lemma for for actually even asking ourselves this question comes from a paper by Isidoglu and Otto. And they proved that, uh, that for the Richoke um, surface tensions, I'll show you on the next slide, the square roots are too unbettable. Uh, so that um, I will not go into details why they were interested in this. It's, I mean, so we are interested in this because of some kind of stability, right? We want to know that kind of, it's not better to, to nucleate something there, um, but but this one here has nothing to do with this. It has uh, so, something to do with uh, with the numerical algorithm, for which apparently this was uh, this was uh, useful. I mean, once once you know this, then uh, kind of the, their scheme works, um, and this is quite quite strange that this appears. Um, and uh, uh, well, uh, but has nothing to do with kind of. Uh, an independent condition on the one that we have here that says that we have kind of this uh, stability. Okay, so um, last thing I want to show, show you is uh, what the reed shockley formula actually is. So this is not geometric analysis, right? But uh, maybe we should uh, sometimes remember that we're actually trying to solve problems from uh, in the real world. And uh, so, so I think this is a, uh, um, uh, so, so this is probably good to know that that this exists. So um, so you can do a kind of a physics uh, computation to check how much um, energy um, a grain boundary. So so that's just one material, some metal, um, but it's kind of uh, um, there, there's two crystal lattices that have a certain mismatch, and if this mismatch angle is uh, small enough. You can uh, do an expansion. You can kind of carry, you can uh, you can compute how much uh, um, how much energy such a grain boundary carries, and it's it's this uh, this function here theta times one minus log theta, and theta is the mismatch angle. And um, yeah, if you if you have for example this uh, uh, kind of a square lattice or some symmetry, then this function that you look at actually is this one here, um, with with the same symmetry in there. And for example, for this one, you can show um, that this embeddability is, uh, is verified. Okay, so um, let me summarize uh, what, what, what I told you. So, I mean, there's these uh, pair calibrations by Lawler and Morgan, which you can use to prove that something is a global minimizer. Um, and so I showed you this uh, new notion of local pair calibrations, and they can be used to show local minimality. And we, we kind of used them in the talk to show that uh, regular flat part partitions um, are local minimizers by showing that they admit such a, um, such a calibration. 
Um, one question that is uh, still a work in progress is, um, are all local minima given by regular flat partitions or are the other ones? And uh, so this is, uh, and of course you could ask what, what happens in higher dimensions. That's also a good question. And yeah, and I'm happy to hear more questions. And uh, there's some uh, experiment I did on my uh, balcony, which is not uh, the same because here I look at soap bubbles. So there's pressure there. So they are not um, zero mean curvature, but constant mean curvature. But, uh, but anyways, I want to share this with you. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take, uh, take questions from you. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Are there any questions? Please let me know.